Hi folks, and welcome to the start of a new series of videos covering the V for Victory and World at War computer war games that were developed by Atomic Games and published from the early to mid 90s. These games were essentially computer versions of the classic hex and tile based board war games of the era, but were far more advanced and realistic than their board game brethren. They had an intuitive and well designed user interface and were graphically superb for their time. Now the intent of this retrospective is to serve as an introduction to a Let's Play series of videos that I plan on producing for these games, which will start off with a short scenario from the first game, V for Victory, D-Day, Utah Beach, followed by a playthrough of the full campaign for that game playing as the Allies. And if all goes well, then I plan on further Let's Plays of the other games in the series. But I'm getting ahead of myself, let's get back to the retrospective. There's a lot to cover, so I've broken this down into a number of episodes. This first episode introduces the game's developer, Atomic Games, and takes a look at the development of D-Day Utah Beach. Subsequent episodes will cover the later games in the V for Victory series, the change of publisher from 360 Pacific to the Avalon Hill Company, the World at War series of games, and the acrimonious breakup of the Atomic Games-Avalon Hill relationship, which also sadly marked the end of Atomic's development of this style of war game, as they moved on to their much more popular Close Combat series of tactical war games. Atomic Games was formed in 1989 by three wargaming buddies, Keith Zabalawi, Larry Merkel and Ed Rains, all of whom also worked in the aerospace industry. Keith was a NASA programmer and had been a part-time game designer and programmer going back nearly a decade. He was friends with Richard Garriott, aka Lord British, who is famous for creating the Ultima series of games. Keith's gaming credits include graphic design for the Apple II version of the 1980 game Macalabeth, programming on the 1982 Apple II version of Ultima 2, The Revenge of the Enchantress, and designing and programming Ultima Escape from Mount Drash for the Commodore VIC-20. It was barely published in 1983 by Sierra, but that's another story. Ed Rains was a lifelong board war gamer, World War II buff and amateur military historian. Like Keith, he also had some history with game design, having already worked on many unpublished game designs in the 70s, often working with Eric Young, who would, later, go on effectively to replace Ed at Atomic Games, working as their historian on the V for Victory, World at War and Close Combat game series. But let's go back to the beginning, and I mean the very beginning. The genesis for the V for Victory game system was in the early 1980s as a new, but reasonably conventional, board war game system. Two games, Relikairi Lukai and Stalingrad, were researched, designed, playtested and completed at the time by Ed Rains and Eric Young, and work had begun on three more. Although some initial steps were taken towards publication, with Very Kairi Lukai nearly being published in 1983, ultimately none of the games were ever published as board war games and no further work was attempted. Then, in July 1989, seven war gamers started a double blind, umpired game of SPI's Atlantic Wall board game. This game from 1978 is a huge company and battalion level game of the entire D Day invasion of Normandy from the 6th of June through to the 1st of July with five large maps at what will become a familiar one kilometer per hex scale and over 2,000 counters. Head Reigns was the umpire and Keith Zabalawi and Larry Merkel were among the players. Ed had significantly modified the Atlantic Wall game system to accommodate limited intelligence and simultaneous play. And although the scenario they played was limited to the Utah Beach Cherbourg area, play progressed very slowly with no more than two to three turns per session. By August, Keith grew tired of trying to remember all the rules and tables and decided that the whole process should be automated and started work programming a computer version of the game on a black and white Macintosh Plus. Within a few weeks, Keith had a scrolling hexagon map and it is this that is credited with convincing Larry and Ed to join Keith in founding Atomic Games later that month. At this stage, Atomic Games was just an informal partnership rather than an official company or corporation. Their objective was to expand Keith's prototype into a full-blown game, with Keith working as lead programmer and player interface designer, Larry Merkel designing the AI and much of the game's graphics, and Ed Raines focusing on the majority of the game's system design, based on his board game work with Eric Young, all of the historical research, as well as writing the reference and operations manuals. Game development began in earnest late in August 1989 and, like the rest of the series, was first programmed in C on the Macintosh. 
However, development of the game was far from plain sailing, with Keith, Larry and Ed essentially developing a commercial grade game in their spare time at home. In the designer diaries of the much later game Close Combat 3, Keith Zabalawi calls it a miracle that Utah Beach was eventually released. Not only was it Atomic Games' first game, but the three main designers had different artistic visions and motivations. Keith wanted to make a game that people could play and understand, Ed Raines wanted to make a hardcore scholarly simulation, and Larry Merkel just wanted an enjoyable pastime that might make some extra cash. The entire first year of development was done on a black and white Macintosh. It was then decided to add colour to the game, which was much harder than it sounds. Colour routines and conventions are very different to black and white, and colour also requires a lot more memory. Also, after adding colour, Atomic had to keep everything compatible with black and white Macintoshes, which again required a lot of additional work. But maintaining black and white compatibility was a necessary evil and turned out to be a sensible decision with around one third of those purchasing the first version of the game buying it to play on a black and white Macintosh. The difficulties in developing the game were also compounded by issues on the publishing side. The game was originally going to be called Sherborg, The Battle of Utah Beach and was to be published by the relatively small Interstell Corporation. However, Interstell was the subject of a hostile takeover in 1990, and the changes at Interstell ultimately led Atomic Games around July 91 to terminate their contract with them. Not bad timing considering that Interstell ceased operations the following year. So just six months before the game was due to be published, Atomic Games had to find a new publisher. Fortunately, they managed to quickly team up with a large publishing house called 360 Pacific, who were very enthusiastic about the game. This also led to the name of the game changing to D-Day Utah Beach, as the first of what was then termed Battle Set in the V for Victory series. 360 also gave Atomic valuable feedback and suggestions which greatly improved the game. For much of the game's development, Keith, Larry and Ed had given little thought to producing an IBM or PC DOS version, instead just focusing on doing as good a job as possible to produce a game that they would enjoy playing while maybe making a little money on the side. However, at some point, it was decided that a DOS version would be produced, with this job falling to Rob Brannan from 360, who had also been responsible for some of the programming of the critically acclaimed naval war game Harpoon. Rob moved to another city for nine months to work full-time with Keith to complete the DOS version. And rather than a quick one-time conversion, which could have resulted in two somewhat different games for the two platforms, Atomic and 360 chose instead to modify the original Macintosh source code as far as possible to be generic across both operating systems while maintaining the same look and feel of the game. The goal being to essentially have the same code run on both platforms. Ultimately, this created a set of core routines on the PC that mimic those on the Macintosh. Now this approach was also taken to prevent a lot of redundant work in the future when converting later games in the series from the Mac to the PC and would allow for the DOS versions to be released much sooner after the Macintosh version than was possible for Utah Beach. Now version 1.0 of D-Day Utah Beach for the Macintosh was published by 360 Pacific in December 1991 to a positive critical reception and was more or less sold out by the summer of 92. An extensively upgraded version 1.1 was then released for the Macintosh in June 92 and this is identical to the PC DOS version of Utah Beach that was finally released in September 92. Now this latest version of the game corrected a number of bugs and data errors, it ran faster and more reliably, and incorporated numerous improvements including an improved, faster and more aggressive computer AI opponent. The game was released in the typical high quality big box fair of the day, with some fantastic artwork by Mark Erickson, whose many other gaming credits include Choplifter for Broderbund and Gallagher for Atari. Mark's signature style that he created for the V for Victory games had diverging enemies in combat, each thrusting outward from the centre, forming a reflection of the V for Victory. Mark was also responsible for the design of the superb V for Victory logo. The box had an impressive list of content, starting off with an operations guide that provides the player with an overview of the rules and user interface and acts as a quick start guide. 
The comprehensive 156 page reference manual written by Ed Raines goes into far more detail about the game and its rules and historical basis and is a clear demonstration of how much research went into the game with its list of over 90 references. The box also included a movement costs, terrain effects and unit symbols foldout card harking back to its board game heritage. While maps did ultimately appear in the third and fourth games in the Viva Victory series, the promised reinforcement tables and organisation charts never materialised for any of the games, although unit organisation charts did appear in the Utah Beach Battle Book, and I'll be coming on to that shortly. At the very least, it's a shame that they didn't retrospectively produce and sell maps for the first two games. Also in the box was a yellow postcard sized advert with ordering details for the planned and aforementioned V for Victory Utah Beach Battle Book. This was optimistically slated for an October 1992 release. Little did buyers know that this would turn out to be a greatly extended pre-order, much like the Kickstarters of today I guess. But anyway, more on that later. Also included was a PC or Macintosh technical supplement with details of how to install and set up the game as well as an errata for the game manual and an FAQ. And last but not least, a platform specific troubleshooting guide. Now the game came on two three and a half inch floppy disks for the Mac, while there were both five and a quarter inch and three and a half inch versions available for the PC, both coming with a single disk. Now the reason that the Mac came with two disks was to accommodate the additional files needed for both black and white as well as the color version. In terms of basic design, the V for Victory games are very much a computer representation of the classic hex and tile based board war games of the era, such as those produced by SPI and the Avalon Hill Company. In the case of V for Victory, the Atomic Games team took advantage of the database and number crunching capabilities of computers and ramped up the level of sophistication and realism of the game rules enormously. This also included extensive efforts to make the game as historically accurate as possible. One reviewer described the game as a landmark in computer wargaming, while another commented that it appears to have come closest to a perfect synthesis of the board and computer formats. Atomic also ramped up the graphical quality of the games to a level that far exceeded most, if not all, of the other computer war games available at that time. The game was described as visually stunning and like a board game on screen in its lavish use of color maps. The V for Victory games are hex based operational level war games with battalion and company sized units. As with all the games that ultimately go on to make up the series, Utah Beach focuses on a major World War II operation. In this case, the battles for Cherbourg and the Cotentin Peninsula following the D-Day landings at Utah Beach. In the game, each hex represents one kilometer and can be one of 12 different terrain types including bunkers and fortresses. Between hexes, rivers and streams are represented, and running through hexes are both primary and secondary roads. These all have an effect on movement and combat. Hills were added to later games in the V for Victory series, and these were retrospectively added to Utah Beach in version 2.0, which I'll come on to in the next episode. In terms of combat, the standard in board war games of the time was to utilize a single combat resolution table. Now the V for Victory series greatly improved on this by using three different combat resolution tables, one for probes, one for assaults, and one for all out assaults. These tables allow for the nuances of the type of attack to be taken into account, thus ensuring that probes, for example, don't result in disproportionately high casualties. Another huge improvement compared to conventional board and computer war games is that the game uses a simultaneous turn-based approach, which is also known as WeGo. This was unconventional for all war games of the time, but was clearly inspired by the simultaneous turn system that Ed developed for their double blind playing of Atlantic War. Now this approach is where both players give their orders independently, not knowing what the other player's orders are, and then resolving both players' orders at the same time. This can often mean that your orders fail to be fully implemented that turn, if at all, due to unforeseen events created by your enemy's actions. Compared to the conventional one after the other turn based approach, also known as I go you go, simultaneous turns were thought by Atomic to create much more realistic outcomes. Now the campaign game begins on the day after D-Day and runs for about a month. Each turn represents four hours of real time 
So this makes for a very long game, which is estimated by Atomic to be around 60 hours. There are also five shorter scenarios with which to warm up, and these are Mopping Up. And this is a short one hour scenario where the Allies try and liberate the final northwestern corner of the Cotentin Peninsula after having cleared the rest. Next up we have Objective Canatin. Now this is another short one hour scenario where the Allies must liberate the city of Canatin to enable a link up between the Utah Beach and Omaha Beach forces, thereby consolidating the Allies beachhead in western Normandy. Next up we have SS Counter Attack, and this is a longer two hour scenario which replicates the attempt by the 17th SS Panzergrenadier Division to retake Caratan. Next up we have Final Assault, and this is a more significant five hour affair that covers the major battle that took place when the Allies attack to liberate Fortress Cherbourg. And finally we have Race for Carteret, and this is larger still at around 10 hours, and this focuses on the Allies' drive west from Utah Beach to Carteret to cut off the peninsula from German reinforcements from the south. Now these five scenarios are primarily provided to enable the player to learn the game, and it is recommended that the player master each one of these scenarios before moving on to the campaign game. Personally, I've played through and won each of these scenarios, and while I can't say I've mastered them, I'm itching to play the campaign game, and so that is what I'm going to do in the upcoming Let's Play series. But to give you a chance to get up to speed with the user interface and game mechanics, I'm going to play through the short mopping up scenario first, and use this as an opportunity to introduce you to the game and how it plays. So look out for this coming up very soon. Now, let's get back to the game description. Turns are divided into three phases. Now, each turn begins with the planning phase, which is when the players assign orders to the units for that turn. Now, this can also include artillery interdiction, airstrikes, and naval bombardment when available. The second phase is the execution phase, which is when each player's orders are simultaneous implemented by the computer. Now it's during this phase that the actual action takes place and can be seen occurring on the map as it happens, with a progress bar indicating when, during the four hour turn, the action is actually taking place. There are even little green markers on the four hour timeline showing when battles occurred. The after action phase is next, and this allows the player to review the results of the execution phase including analysis of each battle and interdiction event. Now each battle is assigned a so-called winner based on the outcome, and this is represented by a US or Nazi flag being shown at the location of the combat. To ensure replayability, there are also seven what-if variations that can be used in any combination, in addition to being able to adjust the weather amongst five levels, as well as air superiority amongst four levels. It is also possible to apply differing realism options, which are limited intelligence, which essentially means that information about enemy units is generally unknown, with some or many enemy units not even being shown on the map. In general, the more contact you have with a particular enemy unit, the more information about it that will be revealed. Next, we have one division per attack. And this means that all of the units, including artillery, participating in any one attack must be attached to the same HQ. And finally, there's Fog of War, and this means that the game will not always give you accurate information about your own units. In terms of opponents, it is only possible to play the game against a local human opponent or a non-configurable computer AI. Now there were many promises made by Atomic that modem and network support would be added in the future, with the game's interface even having greyed out options for this in every version. There was even a card included in later games in the series stating that Atomic were working on producing a communications diskette that would add modem support, and they offered this free to those who requested the diskette, and it would be provided as soon as it became available. Unfortunately, the communications diskette never materialized, with modem and network support being something that Atomic never managed to nail down, with it not even being a feature in the much later World at War series of war games that they produced, and which I'll be coming on to in a later episode. Also, an issue highlighted at the time by reviewers and players was the lack of a play-by-email option. Now, some players managed to cobble together a play-by-email procedure which involved emailing saved games to each other, but this left you placing a lot of trust in the opposing player's hands, as well as leaving you unable to observe what occurred during the execution phase. This was hardly very satisfactory. This issue was never resolved with the Viva Victory series, and official play-by-email support only made an appearance in the later World at War series. 
And let's not forget that you can also play the game either as the allies or as the axis. Now the early versions of the AI was reportedly lacking and criticized on various discussion boards. Even reviewers disagreed in this area with one reporting that the AI presents a tough, competent foe with routines heavily based on sound military doctrine intertwined with a thorough knowledge of victory point objectives. While another stated that the AI could do with some work and that the German units retreat far too often. Personally, I haven't played the game enough to have formed a judgment, and with the game having been updated and patched many times, the final version of the AI may well have addressed the reviewers' and players' concerns. I do know that the Germans' retreating issue was unique to version 1.0 and was addressed when version 1.1 was released. Nevertheless, I guess the only way I'll find out is in my campaign game Let's Play, where I call upon your feedback on how well you think the AI is doing. Now I'll discuss the game's interface and how to play the game as I progress through my Let's Play series, and so we'll not cover that in this video. What I will just mention though is that each non-artillery unit has ratings for attack, defense, armor, anti-tank, morale, disruption, fatigue, and allocated and actual supply level. Artillery units have much of the same but with the addition of barrage strength, support strength, and range. Now let's just talk a little bit about supply. In reality, the level of supply to a unit had an enormous effect on its capabilities, and this is well represented in the game. Each unit is attached to a particular division or core level HQ, which supplies those attached units. At the start of each day, the player can adjust the target level of supply to each HQ's attached units, ranging from minimal to attack supply. However, this is limited based on the total supply tonnage available, which is historically representative. Now this often means that only some HQs can be set to attack supply, for example, while others may have to make do with less, and sometimes much less. This feature greatly adds to the strategic nature of the game, with the player having to decide which divisions will drive forward and attack, while others must be patient and simply wait and hold the line due to supply limitations. Also, individual units must be able to draw a line of supply to their HQ, as well as be within range of that HQ to receive full supply exceed that range, and the supply level received by the unit reduces accordingly based on the distance. And HQs themselves must also be able to draw a line of supply and be within range of predefined sources. Another superb feature of the game is that it includes variable strength zones of control. Now these are affected by unit type, terrain, dug in or fortification status, morale, fatigue, disruption, weather, and whether or not it is day or night. Now, variable zones of control lead to the uncertainty of not knowing exactly how far a unit can move or when an attack will happen relative to other movement. Now, unit stacking, a standard of hex-based board and computer war games, is also featured, but with a twist. In the V for Victory games, stacking limits are honored during simultaneous movement throughout the execution phase. Now, this means that, for example, congestion at a road junction can mean delays and other uncertainties, and this can mean that units don't arrive at their target destination during the desired four-hour turn period. V for Victory Utah Beach was met with a positive critical reception, with Computer Gaming World concluding that the game is a must-have, and leaving this reviewer completely satisfied. Computer Games Strategy Plus magazine commented on the extraordinary attention to detail, and described the game as by far one of the most graphically pleasing and downright beautiful games ever produced. Computer Game Review stated that the game was based on a near fanatical attention to historical accuracy, while Dragon Magazine gave the game 5 out of 5 stars and noted that there is little doubt in our minds that this game is probably the best war simulation ever produced for any computer. High praise indeed. Now, while it was nominated but failed to win War Game of the Year over at Computer Gaming World, things were different at Computer Game Strategy Plus magazine, where it won not only that magazine's Computer War Game of the Year for 1992 award, but also it won their Overall Game of the Year award, even beating off Sid Meier's Civilization. In 1994, PC Gamer magazine named Utah Beach the 14th best computer game ever. The editors wrote, the V for Victory series is quite simply the most playable war games available, with an easy to master interface and admirable depth of gameplay. They continued, we single out Utah Beach because it launched the series, but by all means, check out the other games too. 
However, despite what PC Gamer magazine says, some other reviewers were not quite as complimentary to some of the other games in the V for Victory series, and I'll be coming on to those in the next episode. The term battle set introduced the concept that this was the first in a series of games that would in effect be scenario expansions to the first, and while the term battle set was dropped in the subsequent games in the series, the concept was not lost. The later games in the series were released as standalone products with expanded and improved master programs, but they all still use the same user interface, graphics and system design. Master program improvements and additions from later games were rolled back to prior games in the series through a number of patches and updates, which also included scenario and bug fixes. This meant that if you owned two or more games in the series, then you could update them as necessary and then combine them to run under a single master program installation that accesses all of the different scenario files for the various games from a common interface. Now this makes for a very neat way to access and play the various games in the FIFA Victory series while ensuring that they all use the latest master program and scenario files. In the next episode, I'll talk about the patches and updates that were made available for Utah Beach as they happened with each new game's release. But just so you know, the final version of the master program is 4.01. This is displayed in the game as version 4.0. And the final Utah Beach data and scenario files is version 3.1. And unfortunately, this is displayed in game as version 3.0. At its simplest level, the Utah Beach Battle Book is essentially a game and strategy guide. Scratch the surface though, and it is much, much more than that. The Battle Book was designed and written by Ed Rains, who did the historical research for the Utah Beach game, and Jim DeGoey, the author of the critically acclaimed Harpoon Battle Book. Jim was also the president of Arsenal Publishing Inc., who were probably best known for the tactical war game Tac Ops. Now before we delve into the book itself, let's just take a quick look at its development history. The Battle Book was initially advertised in 1992 via an information card bundled in the V for Victory Utah Beach game box. While the advert gave the release date of October 1992, this proved to be wildly optimistic. After many delays, the publication date was pushed back to the 6th of June 1994, nearly two years late, with the objective of commemorating the 50th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Early in 1994, letters were sent out to all registered owners of Utah Beach to promote the book and included a very nice promotional flyer. However, in a later letter sent out to those who pre-ordered the book, Jim DeGoey, president of Arsenal Publishing Inc., stated that technical problems were found after the book was sent to the printers, which prevented the 6th of June date from being achieved. Now I can't remember when I finally received my copy of the book, but I'm fairly certain it was at least a few months, if not more, after receiving this letter. Was it worth the wait? Hell yeah. When I did receive the book, it more than surpassed my expectations and certainly went well beyond the promises listed on the little yellow card. Unfortunately, the delay severely dented sales of the book, with only 500 copies being sold, compared to over 30,000 for the Harpoon Battle book. In fact, Arsenal Publishing was still trying to sell the excess on their website in 1996 at the drastically reduced price of $5, down from the original 1995. This is such a shame considering the impressive level of detail found in this book, and I have read a lot of D-Day and Utah Beach books in my time, but still, this battle book provides a wealth of information that I haven't seen elsewhere, and I find it a valuable addition to my books on the subject. In particular, the information in the book covering the combat forces organisation and notes is superb. So, what does the book cover? Well, the first five chapters are basically detailed strategy guides for each of the shorter scenarios in the game. Chapter 6 covers the campaign game and starts out by providing a day-by-day -day historical description of actual events, followed by general campaign game strategies for both the American and German player. Chapter 7 provides some background to the game designers and history of the game development, and this is followed in Chapter 8 by a detailed description of how combat is resolved in the game, with the inclusion of the three combat resolution tables that are used in the game. Now these tables are of enormous value to the player in evaluating how well an attack or defence may turn out before committing to it. Next up are four superb chapters covering insightful analysis and details of the American and German combat forces involved and their commanders. And the final two chapters discuss the American and German weapons that were used by the combatants all the way from the humble pistol through to heavy artillery and tanks. 
Unfortunately, the game-specific content of the book appears to be primarily based on version 1.0 of the game, with occasional comments made of how version 2.0 changed things. Now this is really the only caveat I have with this book, but I consider it to be a minor one. While playing the final version of Utah Beach, which uses version 4.01 of the game engine, and version 3.1 of the Utah Beach data files, I have still found that the book descriptions, guidance and strategies to be just as applicable. If you do plan on playing any of the V for Victory or World at War games, then I can't recommend this book enough, even if it's just for the combat resolution tables that are likely to still be relevant for all of the games in the both series. On a final note, when you quit a V for Victory game, you're normally presented with a photograph and dedication. In the case of version 1.1 of Utah Beach, this was a photograph of Pearl and Lester Hagler, who were Keith Zabalawi's grandparents. From version 2 of the game, the photograph remained, but the dedication was removed and replaced with a simple, thank you for playing V for Victory. Now don't miss the next episode of this series when I discuss the controversy that surrounded the dedication proposed for the second game in the V for Victory series, and which contributed to the expulsion of Ed Reigns from the Atomic team. Well, that wraps it up for Utah Beach. Join me next time when I will cover the next three games in the series, the V for Victory compilation releases, and the plans for a second series that was simply called V for Victory 2, and which was to start with a game in the Pacific Theatre of Operations. And I'll also cover the ending of the Atomic Games and 360 Pacific relationship. Anyway, that's it folks. Please like, subscribe. Many thanks for watching. Take care. Bye bye.